Introductions Tam Gilbert and Michelle O'Brien in the Priest's House Museum Garden I'm Tam. I'm five foot two and in my early forties. I have long blonde hair down to my shoulders and through much of the film I'm wearing jeans. My name's Michelle O'Brien. I'm over 50. I have silver hair and for the majority of the film I'm wearing colourful clothes. And to describe Helen Keller, in later life she had dark hair down to her jaw with a 1920s wave for it. She tended to wear high necked blouses and dark skirts. Enjoy the film. A distorted, cobbled street. Assumptions. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? How much can you see? How much can you see? How much can you see? Wouldn't glasses help? Wouldn't glasses help? Can you see me? Can you see me? Sensing Helen, a film by Tam Gilbert. I'm Tam Gilbert. I live in Dorset. I'm working disability arts. Students and adult participants taking part in workshops. I've been awarded funding by the Heritage Lottery to deliver Sensing Helen, which is a project that looks into the lives of visually impaired women, a topic which is particularly close to my heart due to my own visual impairment. Michelle playing the role of Victorian matron. It all began when my friend and fellow artist Michelle O'Brien and I sat down to read The Miracle Worker. It's a story about Helen Keller. Black and white photo of Helen Keller. The first deaf blind woman to go to college, graduate, write speeches, become a, a political activist and work. The 21st century is a challenging time for disabled people with many of us facing cuts to benefits and services, which is a huge worry. Um, thank you. Tam at the computer with Access Worker. I myself am pretty happy with the support I receive at the moment, which enables me to live and work independently. But this certainly wasn't the case in Victorian times, which is why Michelle and I are going to Dorset History Centre to find out more. Dorchester. So uh, we're meeting Maria Gator. Who knows what we're going to discover, but... Um, it's going to be exciting now, I mean, quite daunting too, I think. OK, Tam, there's a little ramp up. Thanks, Michelle. And, uh, Got racks of books that you'd get in the library, sort of reference, book, reference books. Hi. Hello. We've come for training with Maria. No problem. Thank you. Have you got a card, you? Yeah, I've got a card. Hello. Hi, Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you again. Yeah. Michelle. Hi. Hi. Just really pleased that the project is progressing yes. as it is. You've got yeah. the funding and we're all ready to start some work on we it. We are, yeah. So, Tam, Michelle, this is the search room. So right. this is, is, is the biggest room in the archive and this is the only room at the Dorset History Centre where we get our um, original records for the public to view. So when you're looking at original documents, uh, as you are from Victorian period, this, mm. this will be the room that you get them out into and have a look. Um, and we're just really excited that you're going to use some records, obviously the Harrison records which we're going to talk more about, but our records generally to bring out the stories of some people who otherwise would be invisible to history, so it's a very exciting Yeah, we're us. really excited too, Maria. And, and I've got some documents ready for you from Harrison Hospital Brilliant. if you'd like to come and take a look at them. Now what we've got here um, is one of the Harrison case books. So we're talking about Harrison Hospital mm -hmm. records, uh, as previously many names, including the County Lunatic Asylum. That's the one. Um, and we, we look after all of those records here, and they are quite widely used by people for family history purposes. Mm -hmm. okay. So Tan, um, it's a big leather book, and mm -hmm. it's sitting on a, a grey cushion. And um, the cushion's there. Uh, Michelle, just to support the spine as we open the book, because it's so old, if we didn't oh. have the cushion, we might break the spine opening oh. it. Okay, so should we open it? Mm. Can we? So how is it sort of, how are they identifying patients? Mm. It's kind of laid out here, you get all the basic data about the person at the top, so their name, their occupation, when they were admitted, uh, previous place of abode, um, whether they're epileptic, whether they're suicidal, whether they're dangerous. dangerous. So you get a, a dangerous, some of them. 
Mm. So you get to, you get a, a detailed bit there. Mm. This page here is for Elizabeth Smith, who was age 39. And these are all women within this? This is all women. This is the F2 case book, so this is all for women mm. um, at the asylum. Uh, it goes on to, to discuss uh, the number of children they might have, their, their education, um, their vices. Do they, do they have vice or not? Do they have a criminal family history? Do they have any virtues? No, virtues no. are not listed at all. Oh. But what's interesting for us is, is where it lists the symptoms of the nervous system here is where we can look to see if anything is mentioned about eyes or sight. That's where it kind of comes under. And for this Elizabeth, Elizabeth Smith, it just mentions that her pupils are contracted. So nothing that would be particularly useful to us in this project, but if there's anything that we want to find out about somebody's sight, that's the section that we're going to find it in, Tam. Oh, well, I was just looking on my phone because we, we had a list of... Um, people on the catalogue who were actually visually impaired who we wanted to look up um, Jenny and I made this list last week from home you can ac actually access the catalogue which is great and we, we came up with a lady called Elizabeth Groves who was 31 and had no occupation so mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could if you could look for her please Elizabeth Groves mm -hmm. I've got a note. ah patient is almost quite blind. Oh, have you found her? Yes, like Elizabeth Groves. I have to stand that. Age 31, single, mm -hmm. Weymouth. That's her. Oh my goodness. No children. Oh goodness, look at the writing. What does it, what does it say? So this is the person that this you... This is the one on my phone. From the catalogue. So she, she's got all this, all this writing so about, that's her. about her as well. Extremely irritable and self-willed. Oh. I always think self-willed is a very great quality. Still has fits. So we've got weight six stone, two pound, Gosh. four foot, ten <gasps> inches. So she's even smaller. She's so, so small, much smaller than me. And uh, under physical condition, it's written also mm. blind and a small formed woman. Mm. Well, that's that's part of her supposed condition to be small. Well, she's from a workhouse. Yeah. Other facts communicated mm. states that Elizabeth is violent both in word and deed. Refuses to be mm, quarrels the other inmates. Oh, here we've got at mm. Bristol, in a blind asylum at Bristol. Has been, has been for many years in a blind asylum at Bristol. Mm. And yet there's Weymouth as a previous place of abode. How has she have got from Weymouth to Bristol? Yeah, we need this story. We need this. We need to piece mm. it together and... Um, we need some more documents. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Michelle. Hi, Tam. Hello. This is incredibly fortuitous that you really? managed to come across Elizabeth Groves, yeah. who you found through the catalogue, where did. normally we wouldn't have individuals from Harrison listed by no. their disability. So it's an amazingly mm -hmm. fortunate find. And I think you wanted to find out a bit more about when she yeah. first came into the asylum. Um, this is Elizabeth's. Um, order paper from when she first came oh in. Goodness. So I'll read through this, we'll, we'll give you something of a picture of what was happening on the very mm. day and week that the decision was made for Elizabeth to, to go over to the mm. asylum. So it says at the top, admission of a pauper patient. Admission of a pauper mm. patient, that's right, there were two types, there were the pauper up. patients and the private right. patients um, and, and okay. obviously Elizabeth was, was not one of the latter. In. We've got the, here we go, 1,889. Goodness. So more information about the name of the patient. Female, 31 years, single, of no occupation, blind in brackets. 31 years, from the workhouse. And um, over on the other side, the medical certificate is what it reads at the top. And again, it's a sort of a, a document that, uh, a piece of paper that has specific parts of it. Hmm. 
So you just have to fill in the gap sort of thing and a proper person to be taken charge of and detained under care and treatment and that I have formed this opinion upon the following grounds. Elizabeth Groves, a blind girl, is extremely... Uh, hang on, a girl and, and she's how old? How 31. Old? 31, you see. Yeah. And, and the, the interesting thing is that she... So they're talking about her being quarrelsome or... Uh, remembering Helen Keller and her as a that's child. That's true, yes. That sort of the frustration yeah. of the... It's just the, the fact that she can't see. We've brought the group from Victoria Education Centre to Dorset History Centre. Black and white footage of Helen Keller and her companion, Anne Sullivan. The, the way that Helen did it was she was able to put her thumb on her, on the sort of neck, or on, I'm not an, I'm not an expert on our, part, on our body here, but on your sort of, on your windpipey bit. And if, when you start to talk, so if we all sort of hum or mm, And then you can start to sort of feel as you speak. So if we say around and around the rugged rocks, you can feel the vibrations there in the neck. And then she would um, place the first finger on the nose. So she's got her thumb on her windpipe, her first finger on her nose, and then her middle finger on her, on her lips. And that's the way that she found she could sense the sounds that she needed to make. And so she would actually, when, when Anne would introduce her to somebody, she would reach to somebody's face and put her thumb in those places so that she could feel through her hands what was saying. And we found that really fascinating, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> she was able to, to, connect. to then connect to people and, and tell people how, what she was feeling because before, obviously, they, she would just be forced to do things or just forgotten about, but suddenly, she, she, she had her own voice. And there she is as a little girl with her doll, looking very thoughtful, and her sort of teacher, Anne Sullivan, beside her. We were taken to the climate-controlled archives with eight miles of shelves. The huge shelves can be easily moved by Charlotte. Charlotte's interviewing Sam, the county archivist. I'm being interviewed by William. We found out about Elizabeth and yeah. the School of Industry for the Blind. Yes, and on our route to looking to see if we could find where, when she actually went, we came across another young woman, Sophia Rideout, who had actually gone 10 years earlier. It's an incredible find because it's her actual application to go, I'll read the top, the Bristol Asylum or School of Industry for the Blind, instituted 1793, incorporated by Act of Parliament 1832. Is the applicant possessed of sufficient intellect and bodily strength to receive instruction? Yes. Has the applicant had the measles, smallpox or cowpox? Has had cowpox. Ooh. Well, the only way you can get cowpox is from squeezing from the udders of a ca cow. Goodness, so she must. She must have done that. She must have had a cow at home, perhaps. Or milk, definitely milked Not a cow. cow. Is the applicant free from epilep epileptic or other fits? And from all disorders that may be prejudice, prejudicial to those already in the asylum, yes, unlike our Elizabeth. Yes, which would explain why she went home. Our team are on a road trip to Bristol Records Office to see if we can oh, find out more about Sophia and Elizabeth. Oh, it's a massive red brick building, lots and lots of windows. I would imagine that it was a warehouse. Um, as I understand it, there were just warehouses like this all over this part of Bristol. The building is really accessible with push buttons to open the doors. We managed to track down the Bristol School of Industry admissions book, which mentions Sophia and it says that she was blind as an infant like four days after she was um, born. 
It is really exciting to see Sophia's entry, but disappointing not to find anything about Elizabeth. We wanted to find some old photographs of Bristol School of Industry so that we could gain an insight into what life would have been like. Very large grand building with towers, a chapel to the left, trees. Along the road, on the outside of railings, there are two women wearing crinoline dresses and bonnets, arm in arm with a gentleman in the middle wearing a top hat and tails, a young girl playing with a hoop and stick, a well-dressed couple are entering through the main gate, two men wearing poorer suits and top hats using canes are exiting through a side gate. Outside the building, on cobbled stones, 50 children, some with their arms outstretched, some with their legs outstretched, wearing black stockings and skirts. Seven teachers looking on. It's entitled Children at Drill. A large room, very high ceiling, three big windows, and 50 children sat either at desks or at workbenches. Some of the children are making baskets, some could be using braille equipment, five teachers, entitled Interior of School Hall. Eight women surrounding a circular knitting machine, bobbins, thread for knitting long socks or stockings, entitled The Machine Knitting Shop. Nineteen women sat on chairs around the edge of a room, floral wallpaper, a large square wooden table in the middle and two chairs. Two women sat on the chairs without aprons, entitled Girls Hand Knitting Shop. An Aladdin's Cave of wicker basket work, washing baskets large and round, bentwood chairs with rush seats, beautiful outdoor chairs, counters filled high with lots of different kinds of baskets and a gentleman at the back with lots of pieces of paper up on the wall entitled The Sale Shop. So we know a lot about Elizabeth, but she's kind of eluded us all the way in lots of ways, hasn't she? We still don't know when Elizabeth was there. No, and I don't think we'll ever know. I don't think we will. Oh, wow. This is uh, it. Bristol University as it is now. Yeah. So this is the Wills building. Uh-huh. Part of Bristol University. And although the School of Industry for the Blind is not here anymore, this building stands on the exact footprint of where the school was. Amazing. Weymouth. We're in Hope Square and behind us is this massive big building which is flats now, which has the, the word groves. Uh, and that was one of the women that we found in the census. Yes, yeah, so the Elizabeth Groves, um, who in 1861 was living at number four Hope Street. Let's just for a minute, just think about what that must have been like, because this must have been at that time, a very busy place, a very noisy place, horses, barrels, carts, the smell of the malt house, the smell every yeah. day, every morning. And we're right on the water's edge as well, so we, we mustn't forget that this is you know, just over there, it, it yeah. is the water. They lived in tenements, I guess, it's, so it would have been Household 29. Household 29? Yep, yeah. and if you imagine that four of them were living in one room, and Susan would have been holding her down her her job as a her job, wouldn't she? As a, as a tailoress. Yeah. So, so possibly a sewing machine in the room. Yeah. The children running round. And right opposite, uh, as I stand here, um, straight in front of me is the Red Lion, a pub. By 1871, they were at the workhouse. At yeah. Union, Union Workhouse. Very sadly, yeah. It, yeah. it appears that. Um, Life wasn't quite as hopeful as we wanted. We know that she went to the Bristol School of Industry for the blind, um, but after two years, uh, she returned back to Weymouth and we find her with her mum in the workhouse. Let's go to the workhouse. It's now 1871, Michelle. And Elizabeth is finding herself, I'm standing in the entrance to the workhouse. There's a big stone building, Portland stone, 
massive grey building. The part that we're standing at now is three floors. So they've fallen on hard times? Yes, and uh, according to the census, um, 18, in 1871, Elizabeth and her mum are at the Union Workhouse, which is where we're standing now, in the courtyard. Elizabeth's 12 years of age and she's had two years in the Bristol School of, of Industry. Industry. Um, it, you know, a place where education, learning, music would have been part of her life. And now as we look around at this grim place, she's described as an inmate. But what's important to me is that she uh, learnt Braille. We find later in life that she had um, Braille scriptures, so she would have learnt Braille at Bristol and been among people who were learning trades. Sturminster Newton. This is where our story for Sophia Rideout begins. 1851, she was nine, and she was living here, in a house here, um, with her mother, grandmother and sister. What does that now say? Gott's yes. Corner! Just down there, look. on the left. Oh my gosh. Next oh, to a school Sam, building. Watch the car. Yeah, move <laughs> to the side. Oh. This is so exciting. And she goes off to... She goes off to the um, Bristol. To the Bristol School of Industry. For the blind. Yeah. Or the asylum. Yeah, which is paid for by the parish. We're at St Mary's Church, Stem, Mr Newton. The parish church where we believe Sophia Rideout would have spent a lot of time and, and what gave Sophia the opportunity to go to Bristol. But it's also close in proximity, isn't it, to where Sophia would have spent her but life. There was a sense of being looked after as part of the church's yep. responsibility to the people in the parish. And the fact that she would have gone to school, which was so close to the church. And it would have been a good thing. She would have been really, really proud going off to school as a, as probably the only blind person in, in school, you know. And then she got sent to Bristol. I, I mean, what an opportunity. Wimborne. We're running a session at Priest's House Museum today for young people from a home education group who are looking at resource packs we've made based on our research. The young people are dressed in Victorian costumes to really feel and look the part and gain an understanding of Sophia's world. I take on the role of Sophia. Four aprons, box with lock and key. Ooh. Four aprons, box with lock and key. The parish will have to pay five pounds and five shillings for up to seven years. It's a lot of money. They're studying photographs of life at Bristol School of Industry and the census to see where she lived. The group get a taste of life in the old Victorian schoolroom. All together class? S-H-A-W-L. Very well done. We catch up with Sophia in the Victorian kitchen. The year is 1919, and I'm now 77. I feel my days are drawing to a close, so let me tell you about my life. I've been living at the Union Workhouse in Sturminster Newton for the past 20 years. Through the Great War, all those young men, so incredibly brave, weren't they? Fighting for their country. Black and white photograph, World War I soldiers. When I was their age, after seven years in Bristol, I was back at Gott's Corner with Ma and my younger sister Anne. This would have been 1861. I was a knitter, Ma was a glover. By 1871, when I was 29, we'd moved to Church Yard. Anne wasn't living with us now. Ma had remarried and changed her surname from Rideout to Cluett. Sadly, Mr Cluett died a few years later. By the 1880s, I was living with my stepfather's mother and stayed there until she too passed away. With nowhere else to go, I find myself in the workhouse. With no husband, or family of my own, I shall end my days here. 
Paul. We've taken our home education group to a joint drama workshop. They share their thoughts on sensing Helen, and we ask, how can we make new ways to communicate? Victoria students take the home ed group on a tour of the school and show them rooms which talk. Welcome to physiotherapy. Cool. Do you want to have a turn, Lucy? Welcome to physiotherapy. How about you, Molly? Do you want to have a go? Yeah. Welcome to physiotherapy. Some people can't hear. They press that. Or so we have, we have lots going. of ways of seeing things, don't we? So if you look yeah. right here, you can see that symbol. somebody that can see can see the symbol. Somebody that uses their hearing can touch and, and hear it. But this one is a squidgy soft pad. Because when we do physio, quite often we use squidgy soft pads to help us cool. with exercises or put them in our wheelchairs. Cool. So there's three different ways there of showing that this is the Four. physiotherapy room. Four. Yeah. Four, actually. Yeah, you're right, because so it press, also says it. Just press it again, Lucy, would you? Just yeah. Welcome to physiotherapy. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. The tour includes Lucy, Victoria's radio station. Lucy, oh, I didn't see you there, Lucy. Right? Yeah. So, uh, this is our radio station. Torren is here, he'll tell you all about the radio station. You can ask William any questions yeah. as well. Spencer, you, you bloke here, he knows uh, everything. Yeah. We make songs as well. We make stories. We make do poems. You guys from... Oh, a home educator. Oh, so you That's cool. Just to see what Do you know each other within the yeah. home education? Yeah. Cool. Oh, we're around, I mean, we're doing a, a drama thing today, so these guys have come in to join us, cool. and um, we're all, we're all sort well, of working together, aren't yeah. we? Joining hands in a circle, six participants gently move in time to the music. Fifi introduces herself to the group, showing a poster she made with a picture of herself dancing. We've dropped into Dorset Blind Association coffee mornings in Bournemouth and Poole to share our research and take some oral histories. The recordings will be deposited at the Dorset History Centre as a record of life today. Our Victorian toys and objects from the museum in Wimborne create much interest and amusement. What happened to Elizabeth Groves? We know she went to school in Bristol, but was sent home after two years because she broke the rules. She had epilepsy. Charlton Down. So we pick up the story when they've all been living together for eight years, and by this time Elizabeth is 31. Her epilepsy is getting worse, and her family is struggling to help her with it. So her mother brings her to Harrison Hospital or Dorset County Asylum, which is where I am now. The part I'm looking at here is two floors, but the main middle part is three stories high. There's a bell tower. Yeah, it, there are many, many windows. The windows are high up. There's a brick wall before the window begins. It's um, far away from Weymouth, possibly 10 miles. Mm -hmm. And it's also secluded, as if building it here would mean that no one knew it was here. I can't imagine what it must have been like. It feels to be very there. isolated here, doesn't it? There's there's a peacefulness about mm. the place. There's a countryside all the way around. It's we, an institution, isn't yeah. it? So we know that she deteriorated quite a lot we do. while she was here. Um, her health, she was very very small anyway, yes. just six stone. But they, des they described her as a, as a small blind woman. What we have is we've got some depictions from, um, and descriptions, one here from Mary Bradley, the nurse at the workhouse, who states that Elizabeth Groves is violent both in word and deed, refuses to be dressed and undressed, and persistently quarrels and abuses the other inmates. January 1890, this woman is peevish and disagreeable. She drawls in her speech and has a craze for her deaf, mute portions of scripture. Simple and childish, talks in a silly way, smiling, almost blind, as if that's a comment that we, we mm. wouldn't accept today. Um, and and there's, there's, it, her voice isn't here, is it? We see a line of graves. Is Elizabeth's amongst them? Large, cloth-bound, blue book. 
in embossed gold writing, register of discharges, removals, and death. Vertical lines denote the name Elizabeth Groves, the number 3579, and her admission date 24th of September 1889. In another column, handwritten in ink pen, it says, buried here. Cause of death, dysentery, pneumonia, age 46, and two final initials, P.M., post-mortem. So we've, we've come to say goodbye to Elizabeth Groves. We're at the end of her story. We found the details of her death at the Dorset History Centre. There isn't a marked grave with her name on it. As we understand it, inmates didn't even have their name written on the coffin. She was ill for a week with dysentery and died at the age of 46. We've recapped our project in our collage to show our journey. We see Helen Keller, Groves Brewery and Hope Square in Weymouth, an old drawing of the Bristol School of Industry, Gotts Corner in Sturminster Newton and Harrison Hospital in Charlton Down. We used the census and Sophia's admissions paper and collected oral histories from Dorset Blind Association. Our three Victorian women had very different stories to tell. Helen Keller, born into a US male-dominated wealthy family, struggled to get her voice heard initially, but eventually she gained a degree and went on to become a political activist and role model. And what of Elizabeth Groves and Sophia Rideout? I feel like I've really got to know them through our research, and it's almost been like paying homage as I've retraced their steps. Both from poor female-led backgrounds with a strong work ethic, they achieved varying success at education and employment after their time at Bristol School of Industry. Sophia stayed for seven years. She learned a trade, became a knitter and a glover, and as far as we can tell, led a full and happy life. Elizabeth, arriving at Bristol ten years later, was forced to leave after only two years following her epilepsy diagnosis. She returned home having learned to read Braille but died alone, angry and frustrated in the Dorset County Asylum aged just 46. I, like Helen, a graduate, am still trying to prove my worth to the powers that be. I agree with the women whose oral histories we took that attitudes are changing for the better when people are starting to understand our access requirements. Disabled people are encouraged to work, yet for many, earnings are capped and impairments are not fully recognised. The new PIP claim forms, for example, strongly reminiscent of the Bristol School's medical approach, are mainly interested in our problems and aren't really geared towards those who have a visual impairment. And my lifeline, access to work, Proposed changes may mean that only those on higher salaries will get the support they need to carry out their jobs. The fight goes on. A clear, cobbled street. Empowerment. Do you need any help? Would you like me to guide you? Just tell me what you need. Graphics of Helen Keller and girl in Victorian bonnet merge together. Sensing Helen has been devised by Tam Gilbert and developed with Michelle O'Brien, Jenny Gordon and Alistair Nisbet. It is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and supported by the Arts Development Company. Director Tam Gilbert Presenters Tam Gilbert and Michelle O'Brien Producer Jenny Gordon Director of Photography Alistair Nisbet Graphics, The Web Booth, Voices, Millstream Theatre, Subtitles, Natasha Rose, Costumes, Wimborne Community Theatre, Music, Alone by Mickey Wills. Participants, Students and Staff at Victoria Education Centre, Young People and Parents from the East Dorset Home Education Group. With thanks to partners, Hannah Baker, The Arts Development Company, Maria Gayton, 
Dorset History Centre. James Webb, Priest's House Museum. Jonathan Hollyhead and members of Dorset Blind Association. Trish Wheatley, Disability Arts Online. Bristol Archives. Link Up Arts. For more information, visit www.persuasionarts.co.uk slash sensing dash Helen. Logos, the arts development company, Priest's House, Museum and Garden, Persuasion Arts, Screenplay, Dorset County Council, Disability Arts Online, Dorset Blind Association, Dorset History Centre. Logo, Heritage Lottery Fund.